just say a few words about uh, how this all came to be. Uh, I was going to the library and looking through uh, the telephone books to see exactly where some of the automobile dealers in Burlingame were and who was advertising and active and so on. And there's a lot of information in the phone books at that time. Um, so one, how, one way or another, uh, Jen, I think, got a note of my interest in old cars and what I was doing. Uh, my wife started talking to Jen, and before you know it, here I am standing in front of you. Uh, <laughs> I not say anymore. But uh, anyway, Mary has been very instrumental. Uh, she's been my Cecil D. Mills production <laughs> for this uh, event. Uh, and Jen has been invaluable because she's got her hand on all the resources and the archives. And so I think we put together a pretty, pretty interesting um, set of photographs. And I will stop laughing about all that. And I will start, start the show. Um, the first, the first picture um, is uh, looking north on El Camino Real uh, as a dirt road, and the vehicle which Jen asked me if we could identify it, but we finally did. It's a 1908 um, vehicle, and what we really refer to as a gas buggy or a, or a brass era car. They probably went about. 25 miles an hour. Uh, most of them were two, some were four cylinders. Uh, so anyway, this particular car is called the Johnson. And they weren't in business for very long, and a lot of car manufacturers uh, in this period uh, opened and folded faster than you could imagine. So anyway, um, I think the point of this is that it's a real uh, transformation of transportation uh, and I wanted to just say that uh, it, it, it's a good place to start, and uh, I'm sure those people were probably pretty happy to get out of the car. I'm assuming that it was probably for Fourth of July. I see the flag, and there they are uh, coming to Burlingame. The next slide. The next slide. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So. Because the automobile was in its infancy, infancy uh, in the 1905-08 period, but it didn't take long for horse-drawn carriages were being retired off of the roads, and the popularity of automobiles was really taking off. This is a, a picture of El Camino Real, uh, probably around you know, 1915, 17, I think, I can't really recognize what the car is. The important thing is that Burlingame paid El Camino Real in 1913. So uh, that made driving a little more accessible and uh, Burlingame uh, caught on in a hurry. There were fledgling dealers and by 1925 there were so many cars in Burlingame that they the city fathers uh, had to decree a parking limit on Burlingame Avenue for one hour. So that gives you an idea. And, and you know, there are pictures around town of the Walgreens and so on where you see all these cars. So <clears throat> things were pretty informal. There weren't any stop signs. We didn't have controlled intersections. So uh, it was a <laughs> kind of a catch can. Um, but the other note is, we've got to note that by the end of the decade, one in every three Burlingame residents own a car, and some people own two. In my case, it's more like 12, but anyway. <laughs> um, now, just to orient everybody, this is California Drive, about 1960, 62. Uh, the road at the bottom of the uh, picture, of course, is uh, Peninsula Avenue, and this has not, the, the, the area has not changed much, but uh, it's Dick Bullis, Dick Bullis, Dick Bullis, Medcalf, Medcalf Reese, uh, and those were, those were prominent players back in the, in the 60s. I actually knew Larry Medcalf, who was the partner 
of Metcalf Reese, uh, Lincoln Mercury. So we will revisit this photograph a little later on, and you're going to see how many of the players have changed. Uh, now, da -da, we are coming to what was Main Street, now Lorton Avenue. And you have to think about Burlingame in that period of time. It was a very small town. But Lorton Avenue was the auto road uh, at that time. And although there really weren't any dealerships per se in 1911, 1912, uh, the this building, which still exists, it's the back end of what was the Steelhead Brewery, uh, was a repair facility, and it was taken over by the Desson brothers. I believe he was the fire chief here in Burlingame, and they had even housed the, the early fire equipment for Burlingame. Uh, but it was where they started. They didn't own the building, but it was it was. Uh, where they developed their business. Obviously, all these uh, old vehicles really require a tremendous amount of maintenance, and he was an opportunist and saw the uh, opportunity to get involved with repairing and maintenance of, of early cars. So, and their business was booming, and it wasn't be too long before they moved across the street. Uh, you will probably recognize this. This is the north end of uh, Il Fornio restaurant. But the Desson brothers built this building to accommodate more of their service work. And also they took on, uh, they took on the Dodge brothers, and Dodge at this time in uh, the 1918-1920 era, became extremely popular. It wasn't Ford, but in fact, the Dodge brothers were a major supplier to Ford Motor Company in the day, and they made a lot of money, and then they decided to go into business for themselves. And uh, as smart as it was, the Dessens took, took the advantage of opening a dealership for the Dodge automobile. And uh, of course, we all recognize that as Bill Fernando. So those two buildings on the west side of what was then Main Street uh, was one of the very first formal dealers. And you notice that all the cars are behind the glass windows. So, but you'll see that changes too. Um, now, the next slide uh, is from the Historical Society again. And this is an interior shot, 1921, um, showing cars in for repair the original Vessel Brothers location across the street. I want to remind people that if you bought a car back in this period of time, there was no such word as warranty. Everything was on your own. And so the Vessel Brothers were busy preparing automobiles, and uh, so we didn't have any warranty work at the time. I can, I can imagine that this was a real cash cow. Uh, we also note that uh, this building, I think I mentioned before, it's the, was the pool room for Steelhead Brewery. So. Anywho, uh, but by 1928, there were no fewer than 10 dealerships. Uh, I'm a fan of Hudson's, and I, so I kind of got started looking to see where Hudson's were located in Burlingame. But of course, there's Automobile, Studebaker, uh, Nash, they, they all made their way down the peninsula. Um, here is uh, 321 California Drive. It's the open, it's the facade of the Steelhead Brewery. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a beer hall or a restaurant back then, it was another service facility. Uh, we think that it was probably mostly tire repair, tire replacement, some maintenance, what have you. But again, interesting that these buildings still exist. Yeah. You know, and it really uh, speaks to the history of downtown Burlingame, which I find remarkable. Um, the next picture is of uh, Burlingame Motors on Howard uh, Street. This, uh, 
This building uh, was not right on Lorton, but not very far away. Uh, again, you notice all the vehicles, new vehicles are behind the glass windows. Um, and uh, it, uh, it was remarkable to me because I saw this picture on the internet and was able to get a copy of it. And I could never really figure out where the building was. And then when we started talking to Jen, she said, oh, no, no, that's on Howard Street. That's the UPS store. Again, another building saved. Uh, a little interesting, little interesting tidbit there, if you go back on Mary, uh, you'll look at the arched windows, and that was a driveway that actually went underneath the building into a garage. Huh. Yeah, I, we wondered what happened to that arch and knew that it had to be a driveway into, into the surface yeah. shop. But, uh, but in, the other thing is, is that those French doors up above the garage entrance and the and the balustrade all still exists. Wow. Man. I probably wouldn't recommend walking out on that balustrade, but it's there. <laughs> so uh, I just was like, oh wow, I, I know what it is now. All right, now we'll go back over here. Okay, we're going back over to Lorton uh, Avenue, just south of the intersection of Burlingame Avenue. This was the Buick dealer, and this picture is from about 1940. Uh, and even the awning is uh, declaring all of the nuances of the new Buick. And it looks to me that they had ample salesmen. Uh, and probably more than they needed, but nonetheless, uh, I'm sure they were having a brisk business. Uh, this later became the Rudd dealership, and it did enjoy a close proximity to the other dealers, and there you have it. It doesn't exist. Okay, now, this picture is on California Drive, wow. and I think this is really the beginning of mass marketing of automobiles in Burlingame. You notice that they probably did this as a promotional shot and had all the cars parked on a diagonal, but in fact, cars needed to be displayed, and you couldn't do it all behind small show, behind glass windows and small showrooms. Um, where it says stock reduction sale. And it looks like they got about a 90 day supply of automobiles. <laughs> um, and this is probably about 1935 from what I can tell. But that is the Arco gas station and car wash on the corner. Um, and there's Noel Miller uh, service facility at Napa Auto Parts. Those buildings all still exist. But this, uh, I always, I don't know where uh, the lady stuck this up with a vintage advertisement. Mr. Motor Car, the automobile is the same everywhere, whether purchased in San Francisco or Burlingame. Uh, of course, Auto Road in San Francisco really was a destination for automobile purchases. Another great historical shot, here we are looking south on uh, Lorton Avenue. Uh, the U.S. Royal Tire facility, of course, is now Stack's Restaurant. Uh, and there were a few of the other independents down that street on the left-hand side on the east side of the street. Uh, you can see that Dodge is still there uh, where the Dustin Brothers had initially put the franchise. Um, and just kind of interesting to see how it went. Of course, by that time, uh, they were not only Dodge, they were also Plymouth. So, there we go. And going further down, Lorton, crossing Burlingame Avenue, uh, there is Rudd Buick. Another picture of it in a later, later version, I think in the early 50s. Uh, the hotel, I think the hotel was there for quite a while. And isn't that Sephora? Uh, yeah. Okay. La Pinata. Uh, the only the only thing is the Rudd Buick location no longer exists. Uh, I'm a little. It's been that was knocked down some time ago, and I think that was a Burlingame parking lot. Yeah. Yes. Adjacent to the post office. Yes. Okay. Well, one we lost one. 
Now, this picture is really interesting because uh, the defunct interurban electric trolley tracks, I think this is the one that went up to the Eastern uh, development, uh, which had long been defunct. And they finally got the money in Burlingame to pull up the tracks. Uh, just a correction. This yes, was, please. This is the 40 line that ran from San Mateo to San Francisco, yeah. not, not the East End. Okay, all right. So, yeah. so this is the 40 line, yeah. I just didn't know where it went and where it started. But uh, the, the, the main point is that it, uh, by removing all those tracks and reconfiguring California Drive, uh, it allowed for a lot more expansion of the automobile sales business and, you know, getting it out of its humble little showrooms on Lorton and, and really opening things up. Uh, I did do a little peeking around that obviously the bus station still exists and on the right hand side is the Don Lee Cadillac. And Don Lee was a distributor for the whole West Coast for Cadillac. And uh, of course, he had a beautiful showroom on Van Ness Avenue and built this location to house Cadillac. And of course, now it is Honda. Ocean Honda. Exactly. And I can't tell you for sure, but I think probably Don Lee built that building. Maybe. There's more to this story. Every time I went to the internet, it's like, where do I go? From? There's so much information. Skip the internet, just come to the historical yeah. society. <laughs> All right, Russ, I'll be sure to give you a call on that. Uh, okay, so the other big competitor besides Don Lee was, was of course, the Packard uh, dealership that Earl C. Anthony was responsible for getting built. A fantastic looking building. I read some of the impetus. It has some Moorish architecture to it. Uh, it's now the candy store. It has been so many different retail automobile uh, facilities. And the interesting thing, there is no evidence in the service department of ever having any hydraulic lifts. So that tells me that everything was done with floor jacks, jack stands, and creepers. So if you were a young guy, you could be a mechanic, but you know, for how long? I mean, if you get crawling in them, out and under uh, Packard's would be, a, it'd be an exhausting day. Yes. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> just a few words about Earl C. Anthony. I did quite a bit of work. I mean, Norbert was quite a noted architect in the, in the, on the peninsula. Uh, Earl C. Anthony didn't, didn't waste any time. He was a promoter from the very get-go. Uh, he was always promoting Packard's if there was a, a big occasion. Lindbergh came to Los Angeles. They had a parade for Lindbergh. They were all Packard's. Um, and it just went on and on like that. So it's kind of fun. Obviously, uh, Earl C. Anthony realized the wealth on the peninsula with all of the Crockers and the, the Popes and all the rest of the, the mainstays down here in Hillsboro that this was an obvious uh, business decision for him. Uh, he, he took on, uh, he took on a, a number of other things during the Depression, because this was built in 1929. Uh, Hudson became a, uh, became a sort of a secondary product that was marketed by many Packard dealers. And it was a little bit, you know, obviously less expensive than, than the big Packards, but uh, Hudson, Nash, Chrysler, these were all uh, brands that were consolidated when business, uh, businesses were really hurting from the Depression. Uh, it didn't last forever, but anyway, that's, that's how they survived. Uh, okay, now we have a picture. This is the beginning of Rector Motor Car, back when John Rector uh, was the principal and it was Cadillac and Oldsmobile. Um, I think Mr. Rector and his business uh, and his business manager figured out they better start putting cars out on the street so that they could uh, attract the uh, passer buyers. Uh, that would be the people from the train station. Uh, 
I took a magnifying glass in the windows and uh, they're touting the new Oldsmobile 88 and 98. Uh, so it was big news and, you know, come on in for a test drive, I'm sure, you know. So, of course, we know what happened to Rector after this, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, we have Mike Park, the last car dealer of the location. And Harvey came from Chicago. Uh, he had been very aggressive in Chicago. He bought into a Buick dealership, uh, turned it around, made quite a bit of money. Um, he worked with a gentleman by the name of Busey. Uh, that was Bill Busey, who just recently died. I've known him. And Bill said, Maybe you ought to get out of Detroit to come to the peninsula. I've got a dealership down in Monroe Park. We're doing very well. Why don't you take on the Oldsmobile franchise? Because it's not part of the Cadillac operation anymore. And this is, you know, follow the P under the walnut shell. Things are moving so fast. But uh, he did. He did come out. He went on to purchase a, the Chrysler franchise, Chevrolet, Porsche Audi, believe it or not. Um, and the DeLorean, which kind of fizzled before it popped. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's just kind of interesting how all these players have evolved. I have spent most of my time at Rector working with Craig Musi. That would be Bill Musi's son. And uh, at the time, Craig, when I came in, Craig was uh, working up in Saramonte for the Acura dealership which was part of Don Lucas. So, anyway. Okay, this is just a quick overview. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but uh, 1021 Burlingame Avenue. It's Suburban Motors, Earl C. Anthony, Danelle, Packard, blah, 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 it goes on and on. Uh, they were even selling trucks there for a while, and AMC, and finally, 7782. I think that building, since day one, 1929, has always been related to the automobile business. Sometimes telling about what it is now, what that building is now. Well, we all know it's a candy store. <laughs> and if you don't, just ask me and we'll take you on a tour. Uh, we have some fabulous cars here. There's some very well heeled uh, members of the candy store. And I mean, we have a Duesenberg, we've got numerous Ferraris, uh, Cad, LaSalle, they're just, there's a lot of cars. So, anyway. Uh, Russell Head was one of the, uh, one of the first developers of the candy store, and um, also uh, Jay Human, who was from San Francisco with Metropolitan Furniture. They were all car collectors, and I don't know whether it had something to do with eye candy. Uh, I just can't be sure, but it's the candy store. And no, oh, you can't come in for a holly pop, but you can have a lick. We have a bar. For those who don't know, it's a private pub, right? Yeah, it is not a public, uh, it is not a public house. <laughs> you have to join. Uh, I, I think I've been for about two years. And, uh, <clears throat> what are the dudes? What are the dudes? Well, you, that's not really for publication. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I should be telling people. It's 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just enough so that we, you know, we remain, uh, we have an air of exclusivity. If you have, so to, like if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Yeah. Well said. Okay. All right, so now, <clears throat> Here's one of the tales of Auto Road. Uh, so, I know it, it publicly when you read it says John Rector, but everybody that I knew, and I never met the man because he was, it had died before I arrived in 95, but Jack Rector uh, built the building on what was an industrial way. He wanted to change it to Cadillac Avenue or Cadillac 
about something, and I believe the uh, uh, the building department or whatever department of uh, City Hall said they thought that there had to be a, an adjustment to that name. So it ended up being Cadillac Way because it is over 40 feet wide and they want to give it as much prestige as possible. Um, two years later, after the dealership is up and running, it is a very fancy uh, example of Cadillac retail sales. Jack went back to uh, the planning commission and said that he had all the drawings and engineering uh, work done for a new 80-foot rotating sign with a fountain at the bottom. And uh, of course, the planning commission gave that a thumbs down almost immediately. But Jack pers persevered and went back to city council. And city council realized the benefits of the automobile dealerships in Burlingame and what the revenue stream was for Burlingame. Um, up to even in early 2000, it represented somewhere between 42 and 45% of the income coming into Burlingame. I think that uh, that was that was known even when Jack went back and appealed to city council. Anyway, the final decision was four to one. The sign goes up. There was one gal on the city council, uh, I believe her name is Charlotte Johnson, and she rhetorically had said, well, are we a city of signs or trees? <laughs> well, that, that problem got resolved. But you know, another interesting little note about is when I first started at Rector, we had quite a few eucalyptus trees uh, between the sidewalk and Broadway. I don't know how many people remember that, but there were trees there on our, on our lot. And one Monday I came in and they were just loading up the last of the eucalyptus trees. And I have no idea how Jim and I got that done. And I have a feeling he paid a lot of money to somebody or a city hall because they really needed to come down. The trees were, you know, leaves everywhere you can imagine. It was a constant uh, area of maintenance. So there's a little something about the sign. Um, now we are looking at the uh, rector facility. Its name is now Burlingame Portion. Burlingame Audi. Uh, the sign still exists. It's about 20 feet shorter than it used to be. Um, it doesn't have a motor in it any longer. The wind blows it to and fro. Um, and the rumor is that Jim has probably paid for that sign about 15 or 20 times over with all the adjustments and the, you know, the, the, everything's had to be changed here and there. Of course, by the time you get a, a trucks in there with hydraulic lifts and all the rest of it, it's a, a major, it's a major operation. But um, Porsche and Audi really didn't want to be in the same location. However, because of the proximity to US 101 and the exposure they decided to stay in bed together. And as you drive down uh, Broadway, you see the Audi side, and it's kind of a mesh uh, exterior facade. And this is the very typical Porsche Rotunda that you see everywhere. And it's all about corporate branding. And even Putnam with Cadillac and Chevrolet, it's, they really want it to be the same. So the, the mom and pop entities are gone. It's, it, that doesn't work anymore. It's, everything is dictated from above. Uh, this is just thrown in as an example. Peter Pan, BMW, they moved their service facility up on Rollins Road. Uh, I believe there's been a certain amount of encouragement to move some of the bigger facilities in the northern direction. Uh, again, this gets great exposure. BMW is very happy with the location. Um, 
I've heard conflicting arguments. You don't separate sales from service, but why not? Um, and one of the aspects of dealerships is customer service, and it, it, you know, it, it goes on no matter if it's the internet, people still have to come in for service. Uh, Jen found this as a 1926 classified ad, and obviously a local paper, uh, advertising auto laundry. Well, it's sort of an archaic term. Uh, today, we would we would kind of relate this to Auto Pride or Duckies, but even back in 1926, it was washing, greasing, changing oil, all the maintenance procedures that you had to do on these cars, and quite frequently. But uh, I, the part that I like the best is cars called for and delivered. Well. Uh, we don't really uh, emphasize that service anymore, but uh, we will do whatever it takes to keep the customer. And so the next time you take your car in your repair facility, ask them, could you deliver the car? I'm kind of busy this afternoon. I'd like to see what they have to say. Mrs. Griffith put this picture in. It was just a recent donation. Um, to the Historical Society, and of course it is now Ocean Honda, but uh, I, I'm beginning to think that uh, Don Lee Cadillac built this building, and it, it's, you know, it, it's, it is a good looking car building, and uh, just to see that here's a little more history of it. So we, we added that just to give it some flavor. Um, let's see what else we have here. Oh, yes, of course. So, this is basically the same photograph from 1962. However, if you look at all the blue flags, there's no Dick Bullis or Metcalf Reese anywhere to be found. It is a constantly rotating ownership, uh, principles, and so on. And of course, Putnam Mazda, Putnam Nissan, Kia, um, Yes, the, the Asian market is producing cars that are very popular. And so there you have it. Uh, and there's still Buick, <laughs> for now. And that is the end of my little presentation. Uh, that 
were willing to put up the money, like Earl C. Anthony, Don Lee, Slater, and so on. The, the factories didn't have the money to th develop the, the, the sales network and find the dealers, as my father called them, agencies. Um, but so, again, uh, getting, rid of the getting rid of the dealer franchise, and it's been tried, but they are a very strong organization, and uh, it's not likely that you're going to lose the, the, the dealership franchise as a group. Not anytime soon. And, we're, and somebody has to replace those facilities. Who's going to do it? You still, even if you buy the car on the internet, you're still going to have to go. Somebody's got to orient you to the car, especially now with Bluetooth and you know all the rest of the electronics that are in these cars uh, and maintenance. I mean, you still need. We needed a lot of maintenance back in the '20s, but they still need to be maintained and serviced. So, Mr. Day, is there a linkage between our? center of gravity here and the fact that we have a concourse to Elegance and Hillsborough? I would think so, absolutely, because uh, the some of the original enthusiasm for the concourse came from Russ Head and uh, and other principals back in the back in the early 80s, late 70s, to have the Hillsborough Concord. And of course we kind of ran out of room at the North School. Couldn't have been happier to uh, see that he went up to Crystal Springs Golf Course when Mary and I even showed our car last year. So there you have it. Yeah, I definitely. More questions? <laughs>